Hare Krishna, Guru Pro. Welcome back to the Monks Hare podcast. Krishna. Delighted Hare. to have you here now. Always <laughs> wonderful to be here with you, Chaitanya Charanji. That's true. So, Prabhu, I thought of today discussing, you know, based on what we have discussed earlier, also that how do we understand our relationship with Shri Prabhupada's works? So, is it that uh, now Prabhupada is our preeminent acharya of our movement? So, do how do we relate with all his words? Because when we read. Some things make immediate sense. Some things will transform our heart. Some things we have to scratch our head to understand. Some things we find this is, this is just so difficult for me to make sense at all. Some, so uh, if we expect or demand from people that, that they, they take everything else as everything in Prabhupada's words as he works as equally authoritative, then it we make sometimes make uh, life spiritual life more difficult than it needs to be. At the same time, if we do we leave it to the individual to decide you know, how that we want to have a very strong relationship with Prabhupada. He, is, uh, he has given us Krishna consciousness. So how can we maintain a strong relationship with Prabhupada while also having a, as Prabhupada himself said, be intelligent. Be, we need to be intelligent. So intelligently relating with uh, his work, his works, especially as manifested in his uh, written and spoken words. Wonderful. An important topic indeed, Chaitanya Charanji. Yeah, I would say it's uh, odd button topics in many ways. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I would start first with the necessary understanding of the nature of Prabhupada's discourse. Okay. And I'm currently writing about this uh, for a published work, actually two different published works, but in different ways from different angles. And what I've determined over, you know, my 50 years of reading Prabhupada's words and my academic training and background and working so closely with so many devotees over the years in helping them understand Prabhupada's words, that really Prabhupada's discourse can be understood at three levels. Okay. And by articulating these three levels, we can better understand what our relationship is with Prabhupada's words. Mm. And when we say our, of course, we are comprised of devotees at three different levels. Kanishta, Madhima, Uttama. Okay. And it's not that we are Kanishta, Madhima, and Uttama, but rather I would like to suggest that sometimes we can act as a Kanishta or act as a Madhima, or even act as an Uttama. Yes, I think in a previous podcast you had mentioned that if we are guided by Uttama devotee, if we are inspired, then even a Kanishta can act at a Uttama level. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. So yes. We can good. rise, we can rise to these levels. It's not that, you know, I am fixed as a Kanishta. You know, sometimes I can be very open-minded like a Madhima maybe even broad-minded by repeating Prabhupada's vision of the way things can be universally understood and so on. So, I mean, again, I, I think we have to be careful of the reification of these statuses of Kanishta, Madhima, Uttama. They're more fluid. They're more mixed. Let's not be so categorical which we tend to be in the West, thanks to, you know, Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, uh, who, you know, invented this idea of categories. Very, you know, and a category means that what's in one category, that it has nothing to do with what is in the other category. It, these, these designations are far more fluid. Okay. You know, uh, someone once 
um, asked me, uh, uh, they said, uh, Garuda Prabhu, I would like to formally accept you as my Shiksha Guru. And my response was, well, Prabhu, you can do what you want, but what I'd like to suggest is this. When I state something that really inspires you and lifts you up in Krishna Bhakti, then I'm your Shiksha Guru. But if I say something that's stupid and uninspiring, I'm not your Shiksha Guru. So let's do it on a sentence by sentence basis. That's interesting. <laughs> so the idea is, you know, let's not, you know, again, reification is dangerous. Yes. I, I, you know, in the last few years, again and again, I've been realizing this, that uh, any system of taxonomy that we have, it's always an approximation. Like if we make yeah. a map of a country, it's a neat category. Here is America, here is Canada, or here is India, here is China. Mm -hmm. Actually, you go on the ground, the boundaries are not so clearly defined. Yeah. So, right. so similarly, when we have conceptual categories, we are basically yeah. like creating a map, a mental map on the territory that is a reality. That's right. So even when you talk about the modes, I think we may say that we may not be in the mode of goodness, but sometimes we can act in the mode of goodness. That's right. We may be in the mode of goodness, but sometimes we may act in the mode of ignorance. That's right. So I had never thought of applying this to Kanishta Madhya and Uttama also. Yes. It is, and Krishna clearly says, and one says that uh, he, uh, he, he, he actually states against the reification of the categories of the modes because I think 14, 10, he says that these are always in competition. That's right. Sometimes one rises and sometimes other rises. That's right. Exactly. It's a fluid thing, Chaitanya Charanji. So, you know, um, so that is a consideration once we establish the nature of Prabhupada's discourse. And I would suggest that Prabhupada's discourse can be on three different levels. The first level being the essential teachings of Krishna Bhakti. Essential teachings. The second level are those teachings which are supportive and illuminating of the first level, the essential teachings. And then the third level are peripheral teachings. They could be there or they could not be there. They're often filled with perspectives, um, um, opinions, spontaneous thoughts. Um, and one thing I need to also bring out about Prabhupada in his teachings, as Prabhupada as a teacher, I can see that he um, sometimes raises issues to be shocking, a little bit like a Zen master just to shock us out of our normal way of thinking. Get out of that box and dive into Krishna Bhakti. And so sometimes, um, uh, you know, Prabhupada's wit, his um, humor, his um, uh, quick responses. Um, I mean, uh, I feel that Prabhupada was a brilliant orator. He could be so quick on his feet, you know. Uh, and uh, it's 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 always fun to see how Prabhupada will respond to different questions, good ones, bad ones, mediocre ones, brilliant ones, whatever the questions. Prabhupada always had a response. Never was he at a loss for words. Mm -hmm. So, so one thing we need to know also is not only was Prabhupada you know, had his own teaching style um, that was, um, you know, full of wit and spontaneity and, and perspectives, um, which he may not have even, even taken so seriously in one level. But one thing we also have to know about his written works as well is that if you, have, if you analyze Prabhupada's um, assertions, philosophical assertions, in many cases, 
they're not fully rational. They're not grounded in necessarily facts. Sometimes he uses hyperbole, making a relative issue an absolute issue. Um, you know, if you analyze, you know, objectively his um, uh, various forms of rhetoric, you would be finding um, flaws. So why does anyone listen to Prabhupada? I'll tell you why. Because he is the most powerful ambassador of Krishna Bhakti extraordinaire. And that because of that, he can get away with statements that are perhaps a little sloppy on their logical level or refer to some obscure doctor in Calcutta, you know, I mean, really, who would do that? Now, can I get away with that? No, I can't get away with that because I am subject to, uh, um, you know, uh, challenges of a rational kind, not just from God brothers and God sisters and uh, my Vaishnava brothers and sisters, but also in the academic setting, I can't get away with that. So. But why did people, why did my colleagues in the academic realm appreciate Prabhupada so much, even when they saw these things? Because most powerfully coming through this kind of rhetoric, which is very mixed, most powerfully he transmitted the Krishna Bhakti teachings. That's how he did it. You spoke a lot. If you, if I may just <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, I mean, spoke a lot means it's just a lot of points you made in this. Yes. So, this point that that Prabhupada had his speaking and teaching style, that is a very significant point. I remember talking with Ravindra Sarupro once, and he mentioned to me how Prabhupada was asked that uh, you know wh why do you claim that the say the Sun is closer than the moon. And Prabhupada answered, Why does Sunday come before Monday? And the, the person who asked this question was completely stumped by it. And Prabhupada just laughed and went on with it. But he said, He told me that I can't use this argument. <laughs> <laughs> Logically, it's, it's, I think it's called a non sequitur. So the That's right. Unrelated. That's right. So, so Prabhupada's. Uh, transmission of spiritual bhakti, of bhakti, his spiritual stature, even I would say his age, all these played a factor in people not uh, questioning him uh, when he was, uh, when he made certain statements. So just to backtrack a little bit, uh, for some devotees, it might seem even sacrilegious to consider that Prabhupada's, uh, that we might say that Prabhupada's statements are not rational. Or that uh, Prabhupada had a particular way of speaking, which involved some things which are not uh, which are not perfect. So, how do we address that concern that that we are not we are not disrespecting or leave alone offending Prabhupada by by when we are analyzing his teaching style or the content of his teachings. Okay, my job as a disciple of Srila Prabhupada and as someone who's um, beginning writing in the academics was appreciated by Srila Prabhupada. Hmm. My job is to help people understand and appreciate Srila Prabhupada's teachings. That's my, that's my life work. So in, I think devotees who are very dedicated, I mean, very, very dedicated, my, uh, I bow down to all of them. The fear of being disloyal to Prabhupada by seeing Prabhupada's, um, by, by, by uh, 
uh, entertaining the suggestion that Prabhupada's writings or um, uh, spoken words are in some sense uh, not fully logical or rational or grounded in, 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 in strong rhetoric and so on. I understand, but if we, we have to see the way others could see Prabhupada, and we have to use measurements that are commonly not just accepted, but are, are intuitive. Mm -hmm. So now that said, again, I have to resort to this kind of exceptional power that Prabhupada had that he could work through such non-rational or irrational or, or illogical types of statements because behind them, he was making a point. Ooh. Behind them and through them was coming Krishna Bhakti. And it wasn't just his age. You mentioned age, you know, I'm close to his age and I can't get away with that. Okay, so, you know, I'm, I'm not far from Prabhupada's age when he came to America. So, I mean, if I start talking to you the way that Prabhupada talked to us, you might end this interview very quickly. <laughs> uh, I, I, you would have to announce to your audience, well, uh, Garuda Prabhu, very nice fellow, I suppose, but uh, he's an irrational uh, fellow and I couldn't make any sense of him at times and, you know, so on. Now, now, how, but, but you see what, what is consistent with Prabhupada is the way his transmission, his ambassadorship of Krishna Bhakti powerfully saturated everything he did. So it didn't, in one sense, it doesn't matter what Prabhupada says. In a peculiar way, it doesn't matter what Prabhupada says because the Krishna Bhakti saturated it. Hmm. On another level, of course, there was intentionality behind what Prabhupada said, and we can look at that as well. But as someone in the academics and someone who's a trained scholar, I've put my thinking very carefully to all of this. Yes, Paul. Yes, too. This is a very important perspective that we may view Prabhupada in a particular way, but the world is not going to view him in that way. And yes. if we want to, if we want Prabhupada to be respected by the world, you know, we have to help them see his wisdom. And yes. in one sense, we can say that what we are doing is not that we are not that we are disrespecting Prabhupada, no. but we are removing those obstacles or those statements that may cause people to disrespect Prabhupada. Okay, well, let me respond to that. We're not exactly removing them. We're translating them. Yeah, I would say that by translate, not, I'm not removing the statements, but removing the obstacles. So statements which, okay, okay. Yes. Statements which could become as obstacles, we remove those yes. obstacles by translating them. Yes, beautiful. And, I misunderstood. That's yeah. right. That's beautifully put, uh, Chaitanya Charanji. Yes, the removal of the obstacles is to try to bring people to an understanding of Prabhupada's ambassadorship. The way he saturated everything. Look, Chaitanya Charanji, um, uh, I uh, emailed you earlier this morning saying, do we have a meeting today? So there's Garuda, you know, absent-minded professor or whatever. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, now, now, you know, I was um, uh, absorbed in working on one of one of my books that is late to the publisher and so on. And that's fine and well. And so I'm, I like to think of myself as absorbed in, in various Krishna Bhakti activities and that's fine. So I forgot one Krishna Bhakti activity 
because I was engaged in another Krishna Bhakti activity. Hmm. Okay, now someone in the mundane world will forget one thing because they're in one mundane thing because they've, they're engaged in another mundane thing. Okay, now Prabhupada, on the other hand, is engaged at a very transcendent level. And when he condescends, not in the pejorative sense, but literally condescends okay. to our world, everything is saturated with Krishna Bhakti. Hmm. So it's different. His, my mistake and his so-called mistake, these are different categories of mistake. Prabhupada is well known for driving along Starro Drive in Boston. And there's a point in Starro Drive where it's a kind of a fast road and you go up a hill a little bit and then there's a quick dip down into a tunnel and on the bridge above the tunnel is a Coca-Cola sign and probably, and, and we, you only see it for a second, right? So we went, so, so they went under and Prabhupada said, Goloka? Oh God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Goloka, Coca-Cola, Goloka, Coca-Cola. Okay, now, if I did that, someone would turn to me and say, no, Garuda, that was a Coca-Cola sign. Now, when Prabhupada does it, there's a presence. There is a fullness. There is a kind of transmission of something very whole and very mystical. Now, it is for those of us who understand that, we have to translate that meaning and that power. Beautiful example, bro. So this categorical difference. So the fear, you could put it this way, that our fear is that if we look at some mistake, something which is mistaken in Prabhupada's words, our fear is that we are treating him uh, like another human being. And we know that he's categorically different. But what we are overlooking in that fear is because of that mistake, others may treat him like that and they will miss out what he is offering, which is distinct. So exactly. in, that, in that sense, we we need to, so we need to, I, I like the word translate in terms of explaining. And I was, while you were speaking, I was also thinking in some ways, Prabhupada himself has given us the mandate to do this. In, if you see in that Bhagavatam, fifth canto, first chapter, Tadvag Visargo Janatag Viplavo, says that every, every word in these glorifications of the Lord may be filled with mistakes. That's right. But I, it's exactly the similar word to saturated in that filled with spiritual potency meant to, uh, meant to bring about a revolution in the misdirected lives of people. That's right. And that Prabhupada in the purport also says that our attempts to present this in the English language, which is foreign for us, will be, will not be, will be difficult. Yes. But we hope that thoughtful people will see that this is a science of spiritual values. And then they will accept the essence. So, so Prabhupada also wanted his editors to edit his books. Of course, we could go into how, how far they have gone in editing and that's a different subject. Don't but, get me started. Yeah, I won't get it. Right? But my point is that uh, <laughs> Prabhupada didn't claim perfection in, for, in his English language. And he wanted his disciples to bring his English, bring his uh, words works to a standard level of English. And going back to your earlier point is there are certain forms of measurement which are un which are standard or which are also intuitive. So what is grammatically correct and what is not grammatically correct that is something which is uh, which is which is in one sense evident for anybody who knows a bit of grammar. So yeah. we have to make sure that Prabhupada is uh, Prabhupada's words are aligned with a normal grammatical sense. Yes. Yes. So, so language is relatively easy to understand, but you know, when we go forward from that to logic or reason, logic or reasoning, somehow it seems to cut too close to the nerve. Yes, because, that's right. Because language is a skill, and somebody might be that no, not good, so good or not so good. But when we see Prabhupada using certain arguments, so we may we may feel that the arguments. Uh, how can you question those arguments? So what you are saying is. 
that rather than focusing on the argument focus on the point that is being conveyed or that is the central for which this argument is a is a tool or a aid that's right so when we are differentiating like this at that time what we are actually doing going back to your earlier point of say categories being reified so if we reify if we make prabhupad's words this is this all of prabhupad's words are perfect yes they are perfect in the sense that they are transmitting krishna bhakti but yeah. some aspects of them so like the language or in some cases the rhetoric you know we need to be able to help others see beyond those to the perfection of the message of krishna bhakti yes yes good now now yes the, my mistakes are not of the same status as prabhupad's so called mistakes when he makes a mistake he is mistaking one part of krishna for another part of krishna when i make a mistake i am taking one part of the material world for another part of the material world there's a big difference let me put it this way when a 3 year old makes a mistake like loses the car keys because he may be playing with the car keys mm. and when his father loses the car keys he's losing them in a different way than the than the than the toddler is the toddler's playing with the car keys and has no idea what he's playing with the adult knows exactly what the car keys are and when he loses them he's losing them because he's busy taking care of the toddler and everything else he has so much more his kshetra is far more far greater far more a level of responsibility than the toddler's little narrow world <laughs> prabhupad's vision was a world vision was a transcendental vision when prabhupada makes a mistake and i don't mind saying he made mistakes they are of a totally different order of being prabhu i'll tell you a mistake that prabhupada made prabhupada made the mistake of trusting his disciples to take care of children in the gurukula disasters happened let's not let, let's not try to throw that under the rug disasters happened um uh, uh um it, it was either a, a too much uh, of a responsibility which is the which is understandable at, at, at times of course and at the worst um sick people people who have or have a sickness of pedophilia were able to take advantage now prabhupad you know from his transcendent viewpoint at some point you know he had to make a decision do i do i move the 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 um growth of the movement in this direction or do i not can i trust my disciples are they mature enough or are they not mm. he made a decision to trust them and we failed him yes we failed him and whatever transcendent you know vision prabhupad had we were not able to rise to it in fact let me ask you what transcendent what 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 how how have we ever been able to rise to any aspect of prabhupad's transcendent vision i don't know that any anyone has reached it fully but we can come closer or we can come further away and sometimes it's so far away it becomes destructive self destructive to the very movement that prabhupad wanted to construct not destruct so you know um uh prabhupad also entrusted us with his vani 
his written and his spoken Vani. Are we adequate hosts and caretakers of his Vani? the way he said he would be eternally present with us. Are we really, you know, uh, custodians, proper custodians of Prabhupada's words? We have not been, in my unhumble opinion. The thing that we need to do is to create bhashya or commentary on Prabhupada's commentaries and continue the Bhashya tradition that we've always been. Instead, we're writing memoirs. Wonderful. I'm not saying we shouldn't write memoirs. We're writing, uh, uh, you know, uh, independent uh, commentaries on on sacred texts and so on, including myself, um, doing translations um, of works for various audiences and so on. Um, we're writing um, um, uh, uh, about um, uh, bi biographical things about Prabhupada. Wonderful, wonderful works have been done. The only thing we have not done, the only oversight, the major oversight that we have been, you know, having is the non-continuation of the Bhashya tradition. Vishwanatha Chakravarti commented on, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Baladev's writings, and then uh, ba Baladev commented on, on Rupa's or Jiva's writing, and Jiva commented on Sanatana and Rupa's. I mean, there's a Bhashya tradition here, yeah? Uh, uh, you know, then there's commentary on, on Sridhar Swami. You know, there's a there's a lineage here, yes. And and each, you know, Vishwanatha never commented on 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 Hitler, because Hitler wasn't around then. Hmm. So those are peripheral. Those are peripheral teachings, right? So um, the peripheral teachings um, can be applied, and that's fine. But sometimes the peripheral teachings are uh, desha kalapatra sensitive. Uh, uh, place, time, and, and circumstance sensitive. Hmm. And they need to be modified. They need to be um, illuminated, corrected, or, uh, 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 you know, understood, uh, whatever. But they're not the essential teachings. The essential teachings never change. But the peripheral teachings can change and modify and, and, um, uh, be, uh, how would you say? Um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, creatively exploring the possibilities of uh, commentary. Yes, true. That's a lot. Thank you for sharing this. First of all, the yeah. of the child and the adult losing a car key, it's such a beautiful example. And Prabhupada was thinking of far bigger things. So, yes. so, so Prabhupada was thinking of expanding Krishna consciousness and in one sense, okay, he entrusted responsibility to devotees. I remember a letter from Prabhupada where you know, he encouraged book distribution. So it was young mothers were being told to go for book distribution and leave their babies at home. And Prabhupada said, why are you leaving your, your, your babies? Yeah. You should, you should be taking care of them. Yes. So Prabhupada, that is seva. That is seva. Yeah. So in one sense, Prabhupada expected that level of whether you call it common sense or responsibility or intelligence. maturity maturity whatever yeah but in one sense uh, we could say that there are certain level of articulated instructions of prabhupada which uh, are largely at a transcendental level or he's explaining transcendental message and then there are certain level of you could say sattvic instructions or sattvic expectations normal human responsibilities a normal human sensitivity, which Prabhupada presumed would be there. Yes. But he may not have articulated them, but the absence of that, he was, well, if he encountered that, he was, uh, he was taken aback by that. Yes. So, so in one sense, uh, so taking that same example, 
further if i understand what you're saying right you took the example of the gurukul to illustrate that that when prabhupad gave a legacy so even if we assume that the gurukul that was functioning wonderfully or let's say a temple that is functioning wonderfully during prabhupad's times but the temple requires constant maintenance sometimes it may require reconstruction sometimes it may even require some kind of uh, renovation so many things could be required so yes. the original purpose of the temple needs to be fulfilled and for that now we don't want we will never remove the deity from the temple in the name of renovating but we if say legal considerations change you need a bigger door you can't have a door here you need to change that so many things can change in the temple but the per, per, but the central purpose of the temple will remain the same so similarly we can say that if we consider prabhupad's uh, words to be like also like a temple yeah. then we want to keep the deity that is krishna in the that is there in prabhupad's words yes but if certain doors are becoming very difficult for people to access yes then maybe we close those doors and open other doors for and that's we, right we need to explain why are these doors being closed yeah uh, so certain rational arguments or certain arguments may have worked at a particular time and certain arguments may not work at another time so that's like a door that was working at a particular time but then right. it's not working working now right so continuing the bhashya tradition in your in the sense means that uh, we help we ensure that the temple of prabhupad's uh, works remains accessible and attractive as we would want a, a physical temple to be did exactly. i yes bro no excellent very good very good um um this is this is your talent uh chaitanya charanji the ability to repeat what is said and make it very um uh, uh shall we say well articulated and summarized uh, you do a very good job of that i have to say thank you bro happy to be of service most people most people can't do that um so that's that's really quite i enjoy that very much in, in our um, meetings and in other ones that i've heard you give so um now the thing is like krishna with arjuna okay prabhupad gave us the sort of processes the various processes of devotional service in sort of absolute terms in very finite terms but like krishna with arjuna also he was very personal and understanding and in some sense customized the teachings so we see this with prabhupad prabhupad gave us the books and then he wrote thousands upon thousands of letters Hmm. I don't even know how many letters he wrote. He wrote more letters than I'll ever write in my lifetime. Hmm. And in those letters he customized very sensitively and lovingly the process of Krishna bhakti so each person could take it up. Hmm yes. you know i've seen this that uh, that prabhupad's letters they it's a very different experience from reading his uh, his purports it's the same person but yeah. it's a significantly different experience yes in we see a very uh in some, some ways when we read prabhupad's books we realize his like his head was in the sky yes when we read his letters we find that his feet are firmly on the ground yeah so he is he is accessible So, yeah, so what you are saying, if I understand, is that just as Prabhupad himself customized his writings in his books through his letters, so similarly we also need to customize Prabhupad's uh, Prabhupad's message in a way that it can be ac as accessible and applicable for people. Yes, exactly. So, so just going back to uh, one point which you made earlier, so. i i had made this point with one devotee and he said do you think you are a better preacher than the founder acharya of our movement do you think you know better 
then the founder acharya what will attract people and what will alienate people from krishna so we should simply repeat prabhupad's words and we should have faith that prabhupad is wiser than us now sometimes when you ask when somebody asks a question like this you know, that that question is in one sense not meant to invite a discussion right. it is meant to terminate a discussion right so but that i mean he phrased it in a pro- provocative way but maybe i will play the devil's advocate and phrase it and maybe you could address that yes Yes. Um Prabhupada first of all told us to preach according to our realizations. If you are simply repeating Prabhupada like some kind of parrot um then uh and not the shuka parrot that we <laughs> we shuka sweetens the teachings uh, but the mindlessness of a parrot that can imitate extremely well um we're not necessarily preaching according to our realization sometimes to repeat what prabhupad says of course is part of our realization to our realization is to repeat what the spiritual master has said but the idea is to repeat not in an imitative way but in a following way not anukara but anusara to absorb the ideas of what prabhupada is saying and then to put them in your own language that is more powerful um if we speak simply by imitating prabhupada and simply by quoting prabhupada that's not bad but that's kanishta when we have absorbed the teachings through experience and through repeated practice and reading and we're able to put it in our own language in a way that powerfully can uh, be received by others then that is madhyama type of preaching and uttama can truly absorb what that person needs to hear can be totally tuned in and sensitive to the thoughts and feelings of another person and administer something from the whole of krishna bhakti teachings and customized just for them i would say that's uttama uptama preaching that's beautiful so uttama is not just attuned to krishna and completely transcendental in that sense uttama is also attuned to that particular soul and what they need to move closer to krishna yeah you see chaitanya charanji as long as i'm suffering from a hunkar hmm. self centeredness centered on myself then i'm going to be overly concerned about being you know in my according to my mind's understanding loyal to prabhupad because that so this forget about the other person to whom i'm speaking first and foremost is my need to be loyal to prabhupad well that's self centered isn't it really how is whereas the counter action of ahankara and this is my neologism okay is anyakara okay. being centered upon another to actually be full and and complete enough in yourself to where you can leave yourself and focus on another to find out what is their need what are their thoughts what is in their hearts then to administer taking from the whole palette of krishna bhakti and giving them exactly what they need that's uttama beautiful so it's selfless it's selfless so my god you are really uh radically alt, uh, altering conventional conceptions here so uh, conventional I, ones but but not prabhupads not prabhupads i agree i'm just putting no, it it's, it's there it's there in prabhupads teachings but unfortunately yeah, it's a bit subtle yes definitely the point i was saying is the need to be loyal to prabhupad that could also arise from ahankar that might yes. arise from bhakti yes 
So, in one sense, I I will repeat what Prabhupada said, and nobody can find fault in my repetition of Prabhupada's words. So, right. in one sense, I want to be patted on the back for how faithful I am to Srila Prabhupada. Yeah, I call that kanishta clinging. Kanishta clinging. Okay. Kanishta clinging. The Kanishta clinging to Prabhupada's literal words or clinging to what? Yeah, yeah to, to, to Prabhupada's words. That's right. It's it's it, the clinging to Prabhupada's words because that feels safe. And I'm concerned about myself here. You see, I want to make sure. And, and you know what? At a certain level, that's okay. A beginner naturally is that way. Just like a child clings to his parents' you know, jacket. They hold on to the jacket. You know, they're little. They hold on. They're clinging. But if I'm still clinging to my parents when I'm a full-grown adult, you might say to me, uh, Garuda, why are you, uh, you know, still the mama's boy? You know, <laughs> that, that kind of thing, right? We have, we, there has to be growth in Krishna Bhakti. When there's not growth, then there's a stunting of, of, of development. There's a retardation of development. And if we're not developing, we're staying at one place and we've been just stunted. We've not grown. Hmm. You know, I was just thinking of what you said, what that person needs. And one example of Prabhupada came to my mind. It's humorous, but it I never thought of it in this context. Prabhupada was once asked by a hippie that, uh, that you know, Swami, what is the spiritual world like? What is the bliss of the spiritual world like? Hmm. And Prabhupada said, it's like an ocean of LSD. <laughs> now, <laughs> where in scripture will you find that somebody might consider offensive? How dare it's you consider right, trans? Right, right, right. See, see, see that you see, then 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 someone will take that from the outside saying Prabhupada is promoting the use of hallucinogenic drugs. Oh God, okay. <laughs> you see, see, there we go again. You see. Hmm. Prabhupada will use the shock treatment, right? A little shock treatment there. Um, Prabhupada, and yet within the shock treatment, there's a lesson, you know? Hmm. There's something to be learned. But if you take that statement in its literal fashion, the devotees of the Hare Krishna movement are seeking an ocean of hallucinogenic bliss. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> so this is a good example of what you said earlier, Prabhupada's uh, Zen master, like shock teaching. That's it, right. It did serve the message for that person. Oh, oh, somebody who is attracted to LSD, or oh, I can get so much LSD, I'll go there. That's right. So, in one sense, if you want, if you want to be loyal to Prabhupada and faithful to Prabhupada, we can also be faithful to this aspect of Prabhupada, where right. he, where he is being very creative. Yes. In, uh, in what you said about you know drawing from the vast uh, vast uh, palette of scriptural teachings, yes. and he's not even exactly drawing there and there. He's actually taking the principle from there and drawing from the experience of his audience. That's right. Between the two. That's so, right. So this earlier you said about this uh, Sorry, what is it? That in you know, the rigid categories and flexible. So sometimes uh, we think of faithfulness to Prabhupada as almost like one doing one functioning in one way only as being faithful to Prabhupada. But Prabhupada yes. himself had many different aspects. Yes. And faithfulness to Prabhupada will also include faithfulness to Prabhupada's flexibility, Prabhupada's resourcefulness, Prabhupada's creativity. That if we are not, we are neglecting that aspect, then are we really being holistically faithful to Prabhupada? We can be faithful but we won't be holistically faithful. Yes, exactly. Why, you know, why don't we seek to make Prabhupada proud? In other words, uh, when the child imitates the parent, the parent can be, you know, proud and, and it be humored. Oh, look, look how nice they're imitating, you know, okay. Um, but when the child has grown and matured into a strong adult, that's even more pleasing to the parent. Look, I've been successful, right? And so, um, uh, you know, um, Prabhupada is like a father in the sense that he wants to see his disciples 
evolve and grow and think of ingenious ways to present Krishna Bhakti. Not that he established the be-all and end-all of all presentations. Sometimes devotees will say to me something similar that you are challenged by with those provocative words. So you translated uh, your own Bhagavad Gita with a world-famous publisher, uh, Garuda. So what? Why did you do that? You can do better than Prabhupada? You see? Hmm. Look, my, my, my father uh, went to Duke University, which is considered one of the best universities in the country. But I went to Harvard. He was proud. He didn't say, um, Graham, I went to Duke. You have no right to go to Harvard. He didn't do that. Any, any guru wants to see his or her disciples blossom in ways that he or she could not or did not. Um, an example of this clearly is when, when Prabhupada created the Bhaktivedanta Institute. Srug Damodar, you know, was, I think, a chemist, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Theoretical chemist, yeah. Yeah, chemist. And then, and then um, uh, I think uh, Madhava was a, uh, maybe he was a chemist also. Sadaputta was a mathematician. So is it, was it bad that Sadaputta knew more mathematics than Prabhupada? I mean, was that a bad thing? I mean, you know, no, he engaged these forms of expertise and said, now you take this. Life comes from life. Now you take your disciplines and show this. Mm -hmm. Take levels of expertise. Look, uh, Prabhupada says on page 268 of the first canto of the Bhagavatam, I even remember the page number. Now, how often do I remember the page number for anything? I don't even remember my birthday. And that's numeric also. On page 268, Prabhupada repeats no fewer than three times. Whatever the discipline, archaeology, psychology, uh, 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 you know, English literature, history, whatever the discipline, it is Hari Kirtan when it is offered to Krishna. When something in your discipline reveals the nature of divinity, this is Hari Kirtan. Did Prabhupada ever say, don't ever become an expert more than I am? No, we all develop different expertises. There's nothing wrong in that. Make Prabhupada proud. Hmm. You know? This is you know, raising the relationship with the in terms of the parent. That's beautiful. So in some areas, it could be that you know, Prabhupada's disciples can may become Prabhupada's followers may become better than him. Say, for example, in we, nobody will claim that they are great, they have greater devotion than Prabhupada. But in areas of speciality in the world, like you said, Prabhupada's Never, Prabhupada never said that I am a scientist. He wanted his scientist disciples to, uh, uh, he, not a scientist in the formal sense of the word, he wanted scientific disciples, scientist disciples to explain their, their language. That's what he wanted BI to be. So now taking this, again, in you know, the specialized field like math or any other field, that's relatively easy to understand. But can we say that logic is also a specialized field? Yes. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada, New logic, and he used it, and he was brilliant, as you said. He was, a, he was, it was delightful to watch him think on his feet. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, there is logic is a specialized field, and somebody who has specialized specifically in that field, they may they may notice certain things which others may not notice. Just like somebody right. who is not very good in English, they may just re, they may just hear a particular talk or read a particular uh, particular message or a particular article. They may not find any English flaws in it. But if somebody is sufficiently well-versed in English to find some English flaws in it, 
then we as prabhupad's followers if they find something in prabhupad's words we have to make sure that those those english flaws don't don't obstruct people yeah from from uh, from reading the core message i was reading, reading one book of a uh, uh, on english punctuation so the author says that for me whenever i see anything not punctuated properly it's like a torturous rod going piercing into my head and heart i can't bear it <laughs> <laughs> so you know so for somebody who is who find some logic some something logically not uh, not uh, to the mark that they might expect then that might block them so much that they will just not be able to move forward that's right so it's our responsibility that we don't let that 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 block them from accessing prabhupad's core message that's right yes exactly and, I, I and you know even so you even to that point made, yeah this way. so you know yeah. uh, actually this is a re- i went back to temple example so there was there are many traditional temples in india which uh, the the tradition was you climb up and go to the temples and that was considered austerity and people would do that austerity uh-huh. but now almost all those temples have buses going up buses or cars or trucks going up like now, tirupati like tirupati tirupati yeah so uh, is it that uh, we are uh, we are compromising over there no for for those who, who can't take the climb we are making that accessible so similarly right. so in one sense if we focus on the principle of accessibility then flexibility doesn't seem like are we watering down the standards of uh, the temple by by not having expecting people to climb up no we are not watering down the standards so similarly if we focus on the principle of accessibility then what you said about anyakar yeah. so what somebody else might call as a deviation or a compromise what's it's not actually a compromise but it's compassion yes. and not having not doing that is actually is actually being uncompassionate yes precisely beautiful mm-hmm. just like i you know invented this term anyakara yeah so people say guru who are you i mean i mean this is like hubris would you probably but say we could invent new terms so you know i mean and but getting to your point uh, speaking to your point about grammar probably says not according to the grammatical rules and other rhetorical rules but i mean to say thoughts and the effects of such revolutionary literature is not required not the grammatical the so called rascals they are concerned with grammatical but those who are actually worker he calls a worker they are concerned with the thoughts he says then those who are actually sadhu even in spite of these defects because the only attempt is to glorify the lord then those who are sadhu those who are devotee they hear it mm-hmm. and then finally he says that is the central point not the language but it does not mean that it should not be correctly written correctly or incorrectly if it is spoken by realized soul that is important this is beautiful those are direct words from prabhupad i'm not uh, uh, summarizing or paraphrasing i'm reading from a letter that he wrote so i'm sorry a, di- a dialogue a room conversation yeah other point struck me the prabhupad's use of the word rascals is so casual in a sense you know that yeah. they were concerned about other things now if yeah. somebody is concerned about grammar we would normally not consider them to be rascal <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so prabhupad in one sense is very you could say liberal in his use of the word rascal yeah so it's it yes so even i would say that is one word which also requires a commentary what prabhupad means when he uses the word rascal yes or what about or what about you know divine and demoniac natures hmm. demoniac if i see to someone you know like a colleague who's you know smoking a cigarette i said you've got a demoniac habit 
I mean, you know, that's that's too strong. Now, in my own, look, sura is godly, and asura then would be translated for me with the negative. You translate a negative in Sanskrit with a negative in English, ungodly. Mm. Ungodly is not so bad. I mean, it's not good. It's not God, okay? Mm. But demoniac. De demoniac is when I torture you with a cigarette. You know, demoniac is when I, you know, you know, physically abuse and you know, kill you. That's demoniac. You know? But but to, to, to say that it's a demoniac uh, 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 nature uh, that most people have. So I translated that as ungodly. These are ungodly habits, okay? And we can take up godly habits. Yeah. So you see, language can be distracting. Our job is to translate Prabhupada's English. As Prabhupada translated the Sanskrit, we need to translate his English. We need to create official bhashya. As they put out the Bhagavatams, they should put out the commentarial tradition. Hmm. The new commentary. True. This is the next frontier, Chaitanya Charan. This is, no one's doing it. And this is what needs to be done. And now it's hitting us back in the face. Oh, Prabhupada appears to be a racist. Prabhupada appears to be a misogynist. Prabhupada appears to be a conspiracist. Prabhupada appears to be this and that and the other and the other. Prabhupada wants us all to, to seek an ocean of hallucinogens. I mean, it goes, it could be going on and on. You know, it's crazy. The craziness will go on until. Iskan has the vision to pursue a strict Basha project. And that's why I like the idea of a Bashapedia. Someone said, well, who will be the authority to write that? It could be a collective effort, a committee, a group of people, and then reviewed by a GBC subcommittee. It could be take the best minds that that, um, that can write well and articulate things and, tr and do this translation process. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bhagavatam 111. So maybe you would add a paragraph. And then maybe Ravindra Swarup would write a paragraph. And then maybe, um, you know, uh, uh, you know who, who knows, uh, uh, Anutama might write a paragraph. I mean, and then once you get these paragraphs all, you know, um, sort of compiled, then a committee goes through them, gets rid of this part, adds this part, and so on. That's a massive project, bro. It is massive, but yeah. what else can address? It's like the Constitution of the United States. It, to not have Basha is, to, is it, it's, it's the same as saying that there should be no amendments to the constitution. Many people will find the word amendment as quite discomforting for Prabhupada's okay. words. But so, uh, okay, amendment means one of two things. One, it can mean that you change it or you elaborate on it or both. Mm. But the constitution stays. And remember, the constitution has essential teachings, supportive teachings and peripheral teachings. And within peripheral teachings, sometimes there's some wild perspectives in there for pedagogical reasons. It's a teaching moment. Hmm. Like the ocean, like the ocean of LSD. True. That's a teaching moment. Yeah. This is uh, this going, this is very important about Comparing the constitution pro, pro of how constitution is considered a sacred document for a country. Yes. And it's very sanctity for it to be preserved. It requires to have amendments in the sense of yes. elaborations. So yes. back to Prabhupada's own words or Prabhupada's own works when you talk of Bhashyapedia. And Prabhupada did say also, isn't it, that 
my disciples should write commentaries on my books he, yes that is also an instruction of his so in one sense we are not we are actually being loyal to prabhupad only by writing on his books writing on his comment writing commentaries on his commentaries so another point which you made which it struck me see when you are using i think the word ungodly for demoniac so it is also and you use the word translate literally also translate repeatedly so in one sense we can even say that the english of 1960s is not the english of 2020 and in fact prabhupada's english was also not even the english of 1960s it was the english of probably 1920s or 1930s colonialist colonialist english that's right so if somebody translated say translated a, a book from sanskrit into english or bengali into english nobody would consider that offensive and you know it's a service we are making it accessible right. but i think the problem comes here because it's the same language you feel what is the need but it it needs to be understood it's not the same language right i'm here in maharashtra and you know i i grew up in a culture where we would sing bhakti songs there are many rich tradition of maharashtrian bhakti saints ha yeah, yeah. they would all write in marathi but much of their marathi is not understandable today i would say <laughs> depending on which saint is writing and in what mood he is writing that's right 20 30% of it can't be understood sometimes 80% can't be understood yeah it's marathi but it's not marathi that's right but i would say that applies to every language yeah um, so if we uh, that's why i think the word translate is a very very precise word very apt yes. word so we are actually translating prabhupad's words from a language that was almost 100 years old now That's right, and, and especially if you use colonialist English, then in one in one sense, uh, colonialist values are are strongly frowned upon, if not reviled in today's world. That's right. And in some ways, the language, the words of that language will be associated with those values. That's so right. Even, even if the person who is using those words has no colonialist uh, values within him. right But those the very usage of those words will create that negative impact on people yes And in some ways we as a movement have already started doing this prabhupad used the word cult quite liberally but we are not using that word cult now yeah i don't think anybody will use the word cult no matter how faithful they are to prabhupad <laughs> we are studying the cult of lord chaitanya <laughs> nobody will say yeah. that yeah so, exactly so it should uh in one sense aren't you're talking about the bhashyapedia in one sense we can say yeah. devotee is giving classes on prabhupad's purports say every day's bhagavatam class is also like a commentary on prabhupad's uh, prabhupad's commentary but of right. course you can say the the level of understanding level of maturity level of expertise of the devotee may vary but if we have the best devotees the most well informed devotees come together then we will have something very very invaluable we could say yes yes it's so needed it's the next frontier of writing that has been severely neglected and that is as severely needed so have you i i since you are bringing this up in this discussion i'm sure you must have brought this up uh, with the with the leaders of our movement what what has been their response or is it like too much of hot potato to touch i don't know i mean uh, part of the my critique of of the editing that's gone on in bbt is that they're trying to squeeze new language that prabhupad never spoke or that they claim that prabhupad spoke uh into the uh into the uh, into the books you you can't change an author's work maybe some proofreading uh changes and you know the mistakes would be taken out but but you see this is a symptom of the problem the symptom of the problem with the question of editing is that we don't go in and we change prabhupad's books rather we comment on prabhupad's books you never change an author's words as so called faulty or mistaken or whatever the discourse may be it, you don't change what an author wrote but you comment on it you know i have a nice little book of shakespeare's sonnets 
And it's called No Fear Shakespeare. <laughs> okay, No Fear Shakespeare. Yeah. Do you like that? Title? I like it. And <laughs> what he does, you know what he does? On the verso page, uh, which means left side, he's got his own sort of modern English sort of way of stating what Shakespeare originally said on the recto page or the page on the right. So you got the original on the right and on the left, you have a rewording of the sonnet. Okay. Very good. You, but, uh, but imagine the criminality on a literary level. If I go in and start changing Shakespeare's wording in the original, and claiming that this is better. And this is really what Shakespeare would, would want. And then I put it out as a second edition of the sonnets. That's what's been done with Prabhupada's Gita. Yeah. You see, the, it, changes have to be made under the, the author's authorization. Okay. So, so the symptom of this over editing is it's a symptom of our neglect of actually working to produce works that illuminate and and no fear Prabhupada, you know, no fear Shakespeare, you know, uh, no fear Prabhupada. Bring out what Prabhupada is saying in a way that's very beautiful and powerful. That will be a great service to Prabhupada, in my unhumble opinion. Unhumble opinion. Okay. Yes. So, There's nothing humble about me. So, in one sense, we could even say that the editing was well intentioned, but yes. it is it is uh, it is inappropriately executed. You know, maybe we could have a Mis misconceived, misconceived. Maybe yeah. we could have a separate discussion on editing. But yeah. you're saying that you gave the example of editing to illustrate the point that. Because we have not done the work of, uh, say, providing a commentary on Prabhupada's books, so that yes. need is felt and that need is being addressed in some ways which are which are actually, as you said, misconceived, which are improper. That's so, right. Yeah, so now, when we talk about, uh, uh, did you mention uh, you talk, we talked about the Kanishta Madhyama Uttama, which was quite clear in terms of uh, understanding. Uh, how we are approaching Prabhupada's words, but you, can we elaborate a little bit on the three categories you said that essential, supportive, and peripheral. So yeah. one way of understanding the peripheral is like you give the example of Prabhupada's statements on Hitler. None of the previous acharyas have talked about it. So right. th that could be one way of one way of understanding that it's peripheral. You no, know, I'm right. also a part of the Shastri Advisory Council, and uh, we wrote a paper on hermeneutics. And we, this is an elaborate discussion uh, that we have also had some hermeneutical principles there uh, to understand how to see Prabhupada's words. But yeah. what criteria would we use for for placing things in which category? Essential, okay, and essential, supportive, and peripheral. So how would we decide that? Because uh, say somebody might place something which is peripheral as essential. And ah, somebody might play it's, done, it's done all the time. And this is terrible. Some I've heard devotees um, um, put forward the importance of Varnashrama Dharma as more important than Bhakti itself. Yes. You know, this is see, this is this is upside down. Upside down. And see the damage done by taking something peripheral or something supportive as if it were essential. This destroys bhakti. If someone says only these kinds of people can do these kinds of service, that's not bhakti. You cannot limit the absolute, unlimited capacity of bhakti in persons. 
Can you explain what you mean? Say, for example. Okay. Well, uh, 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 a, 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 a woman cannot be uh, a Diksha guru. Well, we do have some limitations. Say that uh, a person, a person with non-Brahman initiated cannot worship the deities. Oh. But you're saying that the person can become Brahman initiated and worship eventually. Right. Anyone can. Okay. So you have to acquire the necessary qualifications and you follow the process yes. of acquiring the qualifications. That's right. You claim that intrinsically someone can never acquire those qualifications. That is contrary to the principles of bhakti. Correct. The beautifully put. Okay. Yeah, this is to say to, to say that someone can't do X service because of Y body is absurd. Okay. Now there are some people uh, that uh, you know deity worship may not be their proclivity, even if they are Brahmin initiated. You know, deity worship for me is you know uh, not something I'm talented in. It's not something I'm I'm even attracted to doing uh, for my service. Uh, but uh, going on a book distribution is. Hmm. You see, uh, distributing Prabhupada's books. This is my love. Um, uh, or someone might say the opposite. Um, I remember in the old days when there was so much push for book distribution uh, back in the old days, and it was very exciting. But there were some people that were clearly not, not suitable for that. Um, did I ever tell you the, uh, did I ever tell you about the time that Sadaputta and I were given a box of Macmillan Bhagavad Gita's? No, no, you didn't. Okay. Okay. And we were told to go out and distribute Prabhupada's, you know, these big, heavy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> very heavy Bhagavad Gita's, right? about a thousand pages. So Siddhaputta and I go out and uh, we hit a shopping center. And I parked the car and I said, Siddhaputta, you go to that end and I'll go over to this end. I'll take one box and you take another box. And we stayed there all day long. And then at five o'clock, or six o'clock in the afternoon, we decided to go back to the temple and we were both incredibly charged. We each distributed one Gita in the morning to a person with whom we had a three hour discussion and one person in the afternoon with whom we had another three hour discussion. We each experienced this. And we were very just fired up and just, we loved it. We got back. And the Sankirtan devotee asked us, how many books did we do? We very proudly said, among the two of us, we did four Bhagavad Gita's. And that these four people were going to go home and treasure the Bhagavad Gita. We knew it in our bones. Well, needless to say, we were never put out on book distribution again. <laughs> because quantity was more important than quality. And Sadaputta and I, of course, are both teachers and we're intellectuals. So when we distribute a book, now I still distribute Bhagavad Gita's now by the hundreds every year to my students. And I still make them read it and I make them examine it and I make them understand it. So I'm distributing, you know, Prabhupada's Gita a whole lot better than I did back in 1974. Mm. but they they took us off the book distribution because that wasn't our proclivity to go out to shopping centers and distribute books. See, it's called book distribution, not book education. We mistook the one for the other. <laughs> so. Oh, God. You are seeking a lot of uh, foundational pillars for many devotees today. <laughs> 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 so, so that so we were not expert at distribution, but we were good at education. Hmm. So you are giving this example, if I understand it right, to show that in bhakti, you know, different devotees, if they are personally inclined or inspired, they may take some services and not other services, and that's, that's fine. That's right. 
but by mandate if somebody is deprived of some service that is where you are saying that yes you can you, you cannot limit krishna bhakti seva and uh, okay and this you were giving this exam as an example for uh, i had raised the question that how do we un- that sometimes the peripheral may overshadow the essential so yes right. essential is that every soul has the right to serve krishna and yes. the peripheral is that based on certain criteria like in the case the case gender that then a particular soul cannot do a particular service so is that how you are saying the peripheral is over peripheral may be considered to be central essential and overshadow the essential yes so uh, so uh, mahaprabhu goranga himself said i am not a sanyasi i am not a brahman i am not a grahastha etc 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 went through eight things he's not right for ashrams for dar- for varnas okay and yet he was strict sanyasi because that supported the essential teachings of bhakti the essential practices of bhakti when your ashram truly supports and nourishes one's ability to access the absolute realm of krishna bhakti then then it's truly supportive but if i'm a sanyasi because i love getting all the respect people want to people ask me what i want to eat and i love well then you know something else is going on something else is going on so now if ashram becomes more important than bhakti seva then this is topsy turvy and then the whole process is ruined when you say that a woman cannot do this because she's a woman in bhakti mm that does not work you are undercutting the absolute power of bhakti and now you're in a different tradition you're in a tradition that promotes things that are higher than bhakti and asceticism is often by other hindu traditions considered higher than bhakti Mm. you know this is a i think female diksha guru is a volatile subject and especially in india there is uh, some concern or even opposition to that and uh, maybe we can have a separate discussion on this yes. but uh, you know there are uh, for some people just to contextualize this for some people they may feel that the customs that were practiced in india say where there were certain standard gender roles and uh, those customs are supportive of bhakti so for example if now and i am not saying this is true i am just saying that this categorization could be challenged yep that so for somebody in the western world where where gender equality is at least an uh, is a universally accepted value even if it is not a universally practiced value Hmm? so there the gender leading to a disqualification of a person uh, gender becomes almost like a peripheral issue and the gender disqualifying a person becomes like a major issue how can you do that hmm? but say in indian culture there are certain expectations within the cultural context of course india is also changing and india is a large country so when we say indian current indian culture also are we referring to the culture of mumbai or are we referring to the culture of Uh, punjab or bihar or which part that's also a question but right. broad, broadly speaking so if somebody says that um, that uh, seeing women giving brahman diksha will create a lot of opposition and objection in people's minds people who are very traditionally grounded where in the if they they are also bhakti traditions in the other sampradays but they didn't do this and seeing us do this will make them make them treat us as non bona fide or as deviant and in that sense having them uh, avoiding that in the indian cultural context uh, by having women conform to traditional gender roles uh, in some aspects especially with respect to say, giving the uh, giving diksha then that could be supportive for bhakti now we have we see prabhupada in the now i am not i am not taking a position like that but i right. am 
because we are not discussing the female diksha guru issue we are discussing the categorization of peripheral um, peripheral supportive and central essential so prabhupad in in vrindavan when the vrindavan temple inauguration was there he he said the chanting of the holy names is the real inauguration but then he had the local priests come and they had the temple inaugurated according to the the strict rules or standards that were expected for temple inauguration and prabhupada said this is for this is for in a sense pr you know this this is our real inauguration the chanting of the holy names but that, that is what is required so in one sense the challenge for a global move, movement could be that what is required to make people receptive or what will be supportive for the central teachings of bhakti can vary radically across countries and across cultures or across countries so the categorization maybe this essential cent- essential support in peripheral rather than that being mandated by one central body maybe it is best decided locally in certain mm-hmm. in terms of certain things so in some ways you know i i because i i was born in terms of my krishna consciousness i grew up in a very very rigid brahmachari ashram uh, for the first 10 years and then last 6 years i have been traveling abroad and in fact i was been spending almost before the pandemic i was spending 8 9 months abroad and i was trying to focus on western outreach as per my spiritual master instructions so in one sense i understand the indian ethos and i also understand the western ethos so i feel to some extent the problem is that the sometimes uh, indian again this is again big issue the cultural wars within iskon we could say but the indians are responding to indian standards and per- their perception of what is happening in the west and western devotees may be responding to their perception of what is happening in india but every temple has its or every center has its own distinct challenges and devotees are trying their best to negotiate those challenges so again going back to your point of categories not being uh, absolute rigid rigid so we could yeah. say that this categorization of what falls in peripheral and what falls in supportive that could vary of course we can say if somebody starts saying this falls in essential then that would be a problem so can we say these categories are also more flexible and not so rigid the essential teachings and principles of krishna bhakti are are pretty rigid they're pretty absolute yes and i think that at the supportive level yes there can be variation prabhu i mean we saw that with mahaprabhu he said he wasn't a sanyasi well he was he was a sanyasi while he said he wasn't a sanyasi mm. Thank goodness Prabhupada wasn't so rigid about the supportive dimensions connected to traditional bhakti um because if he if he was I wouldn't be sitting here as a bhakta hmm you have to be born in India sanyasi can't cross the ocean you can't sanyasi is right vedic sanyasi can't cross the ocean uh what about uh um Tamal Krishna went back to school which is considered very I mean a lot of devotees told him he shouldn't do it because he was a venerable sanyasi but he transformed scholars minds by doing that mm. I finished his book yeah. here and for Oxford University Press now the point is this why imagine if he didn't go back because everyone was pressuring him not to go back then we would have lost all of that great impact now it's not that i would go to a sanyasi and say you know you should go back to school or you should be an academic or you should no um again everyone's relationship with the absolute teachings of krishna bhakti needs to be respected everyone's relationship so you are saying relationship here in terms of for that person what is supportive and what is peripheral that will in one sense shape their relationship yes and that person needs to be given 
the the freedom to do the, decide that because of the nature of bhakti you you know you, you, the, the 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 to say that that uh, for example uh, women cannot be gurus well they are gurus they're teaching all the time in temples yeah i mean shiksha is far more important than diksha suddenly they're loading up this diksha thing yeah i think that's a big issue you know the, 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 we have discussed yeah. earlier, earlier how the essence of the guru the guru disciple point is the relationship is the personal and yeah shiksha is already happening in a big way that's right um, and there are many i mean my god there's some wonderful female preachers now there are plenty of females that don't want to be up front and preaching so prominently that's fine too why are we but there's some men that are very much you know wanting to be more in the background doing humble service in the temple and say oh you should get out and you should be doing book distribution or you should be um uh, giving bhagavatam class you should be preaching in the university why are we telling people what to do now there is guidance there's guidance and there's shelter and there's um uh, evolving in seva sure but to limit them oh you can't do this so okay. you come from a family of business people so you can't really be a brahmin no that has no it, it's nothing guna karma vibhagashaha right in the in the gita right according to your qualities and your activities you can know a person true so it it depends on your your nature hmm. now for my wife who's extremely intelligent and, and a brilliant writer you know she prefers not to be so upfront but she is a teacher and she put together the first volume in the history of vaishnavism of women's you know a uh, uh, vaishnava poetry and essays called bhakti blossoms it's the first time in history that women have gotten a voice yes i've seen that book it's a beautiful book bro right and i mean and i wrote the the, the forward for it where i said this is historical this has never been done before Does that mean she shouldn't have done it? Who are you to do this? You could say. And and why are women speaking up here with their devotional voices? They should just be in the background. What about Ganga Mata Goswami? Mm. She's on our calendar for decades. No, everyone's afraid to talk about her. I'm not. I wrote an encyclopedia article about her. Ganga Mata Goswamini. Goswamini? That's heretical. What are we talking about here? It's heretical. Tamal Krishna Goswami went back to school as an undergraduate before he became a graduate. Heret- heresy, another heresy. When I went back to school back in 1975 or 6, 75, which was. Uh, so everyone looked at me askance. Garuda. you're going back into the slaughterhouse how could you hmm now people are going back to the slaughterhouse all the time so bro if i understand right through all these examples the point you are making is that instead of we telling people when you're saying we who are we to tell people what to do or what not to do so what you are saying is that what is supportive for one's bhakti the individual should be deciding that exactly just, just because say some devotee may not be academically inclined and that for that person if they are forced into the academic setting they might find it very difficult and for them it may not be supportive but that doesn't mean it is not going to be supportive for others exactly so, it has to be on an individual basis not a kind of institutional control externally or internally okay so let us take this forward now because i don't want we can go into the say the role of women in our movement is also a big issue and maybe yeah. we can discuss that later but let's come to some other statement although, although i have to tell you something 
for me, it's a non-issue when you're looking at the absolute teachings of bhakti. It's a non-issue. It's it, it's been made an issue when there is no issue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just leave it at that. Yeah. I just I'm just trying to aggravate you, uh, Chaitanya Shar. <laughs> just... For some people, that statement will be a bigger issue than the issue itself. <laughs> I know, I know. That's why I'm saying it. So I can get away with it. That's right. <laughs> okay. So just going back to because in one sense there are in Prabhupada's words or Prabhupada's we're talking about Prabhupada's words uh, how our relationship with them there are some things which are directive you know, what you should do what you should not do but there are any things which are descriptive or illustrative so for example um, recently I was teaching the Bhagavatam and uh, the sixth canto that said that Chitraketu had 10 million wives now we, were, we had an elaborate discussion. Is 10 million a literal figure? Now, when I grew up, when I was introduced to Krishna consciousness, this is achinta, this is inconceivable. No, ask no questions, just have faith. That is Now, for some people, accepting that 10 million, yeah, okay, that's okay, they may not have much difficulty. But for somebody who is a little more rational, how can one human being have 10 million wives? And Krishna expanded in 16,108 forms to have 16,108 queens. Chitraketu didn't have any mystic powers. as At least at that time. Later he got. He, if he had mystic powers, he could have just used those mystic powers to have a child. He yeah. couldn't do that. He didn't do that. He couldn't do that. So, now we could say that the 10 million is indicative that he had a large number of wives. And the point of the story is not how many wives he had. The point was despite having so much material facilities, he couldn't have a child. The point of the story is largely to talk about the futility of seeking material happiness, the temporary of temporariness of material relationships. So we could say that from the perspective of that story, the essential message is one thing. If somebody starts saying that you, if you are not having faith in the 10 million count, then you have no faith in the Bhagavatam and there is no hope for you in Bhakti. Then they are making something which is which is not essential as essential. Mm -hmm. now, now for some people, it might be supportive. So for some people, they might read it as peripheral. Right. So that That's categorization right. could be individual. That's right. So for some, uh, so can, can you give some examples like this rather than going into say controversial sociological issues? Because uh, we as devotees, when we study Prabhupada's books, there are times when no, how do we make sense of this? So yeah. over, overall, you felt this is a good example of this customizing the decision of peripheral and uh, uh, peripheral and secondary or what is the word? Supportive. Uh, supportive, yeah. yeah. Okay, so there are, when we go to Shastra, we're reading it either as Kanishta, Madhyama or Uttama. So levels of receptivity, levels of understanding. You know, it, it, the, the hermeneutic has to be adjusted. And the guru knows how to do that. The guru knows how to guide one's understanding and appreciation and reading at, a, at, at, at different stages. At one stage, it will say something. It'll say X. At another stage, it'll say Y, and another stage, it will say Z. There is no, you know, formulaic uh, um, resolution to this. It's all about the individual. It really is. What their capacity is, what their level of appreciation would be, uh, whether they need to take, whether they understand uh, the the structure of symbolism, the structure of the symbol, as opposed to allegory and as opposed to liter literalism. And, and I mean, these things, and there are mimanksa hermeneutics, which by the way, most devotees don't know, um, in terms of the uh, Jaimini Sutra and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the commentaries to that by Prabhakara Bhatta and, and uh, or Kumara Labhatta and Prabhakara. And these, all of these things I'm trained in, by the way. And in all ancient... Uh, Mimamsa hermeneutics. Yeah. Um, and the commentaries of Prabhakara and Kumara Labhata, 
um, and uh, Vedanta in, in the way they're applied to Vedanta Sutra Bhashya. So, you know, and then I'm trained in, in Western hermeneutics as well. I'm trained, I've had the, in the last century, I had the two most famous scholars, world famous scholars in the field of philosophical hermeneutics as, as, my, as, as professors. So I've done the Western hermeneutics and I've done the Indian hermeneutics. And this is what I draw from. And my conclusion is in the simplest of terms, you've got to work with the individual who is negotiating a, a level of understanding that draws from the body of knowledge and yet absorbs that, but is allowed to yet still expand one's horizon, one's, or we call it kshetra, in the 13th and 14th chapters of the Gita, right? Our sphere of awareness is the way I translate kshetra. Beautiful sphere of awareness. Sphere of awareness. That's what we have to be sensitive to, or not. I can be instant. I can be, my sphere of awareness can be so narrow and so cloistered that I can't leave it. I'm trapped within my own sphere of awareness and my own conditionings. And then this is a hunkar. But when I can actually be so full of knowledge, I can be sensitive to the thoughts and feelings of another person. Anyakara, and ultimately Paramanyakara, the supreme other. Beautiful, supreme other, very nice. Because ultimately, you know, Prabhu, if you see Prabhupada's mission was to get people to come closer to Krishna. So yes. if you're sensitive to Krishna's concerns, then Krishna's concern is not just that we repeat verbatim Prabhupada's words. Krishna's concern is that we fulfill Prabhupada's mission by getting that soul to come closer to Krishna. That's it. So, so both Anyakar and Paramanyakar. That's right. Today I got uh, two neologisms. neologisms. <laughs> <laughs> two neologisms from me. Yes. I always like to uh, surprise you a little bit, Chaitanya Charan, in our talks. Um, uh, so uh, anyway, I hope this material was something worthy of reflecting on yes. and uh, thinking about. Yeah. Yes. We just can you elaborate on the last few sentences you said about uh, based on your understanding, based on training in both traditional hermeneutics and Western hermeneutics. You said that you yes. three things broadly you mentioned that you know you so we work with the individual. So I think what we work with the individual means the teacher works with the individual. Is yes. that what you're saying? So yes. you take the take the body of body of knowledge that is in scripture. And then in a way that the, that the student can internalize it. Yes, and not only be internalize nourished it, by it, be nourished by it. Mm -hmm. And the fruit of it is that their sphere of awareness expands. That's right. And for that to happen, we have to come out, we have to expand our sphere of awareness. Yes. To understand what, where they are, at what level they are at. Yes. So otherwise, and this is a very, you know, Prabhupada talks about realization in the first canto. So he says that nothing uh, untoward should be screwed out, but things should be presented in a way that is interesting to the audience. Yes. And, uh, so we could put that in that interesting to the audience means that we expand our sphere of awareness so that there is some intersection between our and their sphere of awareness. Yes, it then catches it, them. Yeah, only then it catches them. And then ultimately the purpose of spiritual education is is not to make people narrow-minded. That's right. It's to expand the growth. Sphere, to expand the sphere of awareness. That's right. Exactly. Beautiful. And the guru, the guide, negotiates between the whole body of knowledge as he or she is able to grasp it. Negotiates that body of knowledge in transmitting it to the student. And this is most powerfully done as a guru is him or herself going deeply within that awareness. 
uh, themselves and and then can give that as a gift to students. I do this all the time, of course, in the university as a professor, you know, they come in, so they take my class on Eastern religions. So I've grasped Eastern religions. Of course, every year, more and more, I devise ways of teaching it and, and giving it to them. And they come into the course in various ways, right? Some students are interested in the subject. Some students are taking it because they have to get the credits. Some students are taking it because they hear I'm a great teacher, you know? Mm. Or they think that they can get away with, you know, less work. <laughs> you know, who knows what they're coming in for, right? But all of them, no matter what they come in with, I catch them. They go, they come into my net. Okay? Right? It sounds diabolical. <laughs> yeah, it, it is diabolical. It is totally diabolical. I get them and I see them light up with amazement at what's being taught. I like to surpass their original intentions and raise them up in my diabolical fashion to an inspired relationship with the body of knowledge. That's what we have to do as teachers. That's why so many people appreciate your Monk's podcast, because you do this with so many people. Thank you. That's very kind of you. But in one sense, now I'm thinking about it. This was one of the benefits for me when I was traveling across the world. I was not only giving classes, but I was meeting senior devotees and discussing with them. Yeah. And those discussions were nourishing for me. And when because of COVID, I couldn't uh, travel just as I thought that just as I am giving online classes, maybe I can get online association also. So you're bringing them to you. You were going to them. Now you're bringing them to you. And we are sharing with the with others also. And with so, others also. And I, I have uh, many devotees have commented to me that many things which were, which they had a hazy understanding or a, or a narrow understanding that is significantly broadened for them. Oh, so, wonderful. So you so we could say that uh, say what we are doing. You talk about the Bhashapedia. That's also a neologism, I think. <laughs> yes. So Bhashapedia. So in one sense, that would be a much more formalized and serious uh, endeavor. Yes. But, uh, what to say, what you are doing through your classes in the university or what we are doing through discussions like this. This is also, we are in one sense, uh, making, making commentary. That's right. Commentaries and making Prabhupada's words accessible, Prabhupada's message accessible to people. Right. So, but unfortunately, it's not referenceable to, um, you know, the media. That say, look at at, at uh, Prabhupada. Look at the teacher of the Krishna Bhakti movement. Um, uh, their stance is very misogynistic. Uh, they're they're this way. They're that way. Their leader said this. Their leader said this about Africans. Um, uh, their, their leader said this about Hitler. I mean, you know, we have to have a a, a you know you know a basha. There's just no other way around it. You can't change Prabhupada's books. What are we going to do? Go in there and and anesthetize, you know, the books, sanitize the books. You can't do that. So Bashya is the answer. So Pro, and when you said this earlier, uh, are there commentaries on previous acharyas works by subsequent acharyas? Yes. Because, because if you see. Uh, Baldevidya Bhushan has say, written Govinda Bhashya, where right. he's commenting on the Vedan Sutra. But are there examples of the Baldevid? Okay, I think, yeah. You Goswami commented on Bhakti Samrut Sindhu, his Durga right. Samrut. Yeah, there are books That's like right. that. That's right. And we could say right. Prabhupada is a, in a very significant position because he has, he has taken the Bhakti tradition into uncharted territory. That's right. And that's exactly. why his works need overall right. in the devotee's life. In uh, in the devotees in the lives of devotees who come to the Krishna conscious movement, Prabhupada's works will have far more relevance than say Rupa Goswami or Jiva Goswami. They are great souls. They are our acharyas, but Prabhupada's works will be far more relevant and accessible and uh, important for them. That's, That's why right. we need we need to not only continue but we could say expand. We need, we need a significant level of commentary on Prabhupada's works. That's right. Exactly. That's true. So do you feel that this will happen at an institutional level or the, uh, have other traditions 
done something like this or other movements or other because say in christianity there are many the bible is a central book and there are many charismatic teachers who come and go but i don't think there is any teacher who becomes like a like a key link to the whole previous tradition have other traditions uh, in a position are other traditions in a position like this where they have to negotiate with uh, uh, with uh, with their founders teachings say i think uh, for example the mormons their teacher has some some controversial teachings about um, yeah. polygamy and other things right so how have other do you have any idea how other traditions are negotiated with this well um certainly the christian tradition has a huge volumes like 12 volumes called the interpreter's bible Inter that's the name itself huh? yes interpreter's bible so it's and only so, in our, it's only in our tradition the word interpretation sometimes has a negative connotation of course when in, in the interpreter's bible is not considered you are you are speculating that's right that's right okay yeah now of course you know hermeneutics is essentially can mean the 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 process of interpretation yes um so you know uh, and then mimangsa it means that too i mean mimangsa means how the the ways that we can think about something mimangsa oh. ways that we can think about something and it comes from mana mimangsa okay it's a reduplicative uh, prefix right um mimangsa means means the ways that we think about something the ways that we can think about something um the levels at which we can think about something this is hermeneutics i used the word hermeneutics before anyone in the movement ever knew what it meant and in fact it was in the title of my first master's thesis that prabhupad himself read yeah you mentioned that too. that's true right so it's in other words this is this is part of our tradition no it's a part of our tradition to comment on scripture but yes comment on books of a commentator that is also part so interpreter's bible is a commentary on the bible is like yes. interpretation of the bible but uh, but uh, say commenting on the words of a particular teacher of a scripture that is yes. like a multiple uh, multi level process you know yes that's right it is it, and again it's it's according to what's needed and Prabhupada's books are, in some sense, a kind of secondary. They're like they become kind of a. They've taken the status of a of a kind of um, shruti, a second level shruti for us. Hmm. And we and and we need to preserve pursue smriti. You know that's the bhasha. So shruti means revelational. and smriti means realizational beautiful that's how i translate them yeah i heard of shruti and smriti as re revelation realization revelation and re realization but applying that catech that semantic category over here so that makes it so so traditionally authentic also and yes exactly. prabhupada's books have have assumed that status like that for our movement that's right so relatively speaking Prabhupada's books are shruti, and we need to provide smriti. Yeah, in one sense, if we consider even in India, if the Puranas and Itihasas not, would not have been there, how many people would have actually been able to understand the Upanishads? Exactly. The tradition exactly. traditions became widespread, and uh, especially at the grassroots level, primarily because of the Puranas and the Itihasas. Exactly. That's a beautiful. But then the Bhagavata Purana technically is smriti. but we treat it as shruti again another example of non reified categories that's right i mean again you know it's you, you really have to look at things relatively speaking in an absolute way <laughs> <laughs> i remember in the previous podcast you had made a statement not make an absolute statement about the relative domain and that is an absolute statement you can make <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> that's how things work yeah yeah so can you repeat well, just we've now? certainly got we've certainly gone on for over 2 hours here yeah we we'll just finish now just can yeah. you just repeat that last sentence what you said about relative and absolute maybe you can just give yeah. a bashi on that <laughs> yes yeah, well well we we have to 
we have to acknowledge the absolute value of bhakti and the way it can take form in relative areas and still and 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 yet the absoluteness of bhakti will still be present in those relative areas um again it's about the saturation of bhakti and this is where we began today's talk when i was talking about Prabhupada's so-called mistakes. Mm. They're not my kind of mistakes. When Prabhupada used a mistaken idea or he made a mistake, it's different than when I do it. Mm. It's different. He is the direct ambassador of Krishna Bhakti and everything that comes that was uttered from his mouth and written by his hand. This is saturation. And I, if I said the identical thing, this is why it's not necessarily good to simply repeat what Prabhupada says, but to digest it and to, to, to then put it in words that do make sense for you, because you can't get away with what Prabhupada did. Um, you know the, the and and you know what I mean if I if I went to um, a, a meal a restaurant and you asked me how did, how was the food at the restaurant I said it was good and then uh, you said well but Garuda didn't you like vomit it didn't you vomit it all up after the meal I'm sorry for the gross uh, uh, analogy here but and I said well yeah but it tasted good at the time we're not here to simply regurgitate. We're here to digest, turn it into energy, and then put out the actions. So, as a provocative example, visually. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are you comparing to uh, uh, enjoying while eating and then vomiting out? So, you are saying okay. you just repeat without understanding that what I've Prabhupada heard. I, I've heard people, oh. I've heard devotees <laughs> repeat what Prabhupada has said two guests at Sunday feast lectures, and it just was like vomiting on them. My God. They didn't receive it. They didn't receive it well. It was insensitive. This is really a, a, a provocative expose of the idea of parroting. Yes. Parroting might seem harmless, but vomiting out food can be harmful. Can be it was when, when I ate it at the time, it was great. So just because when I heard something, it nourished me, doesn't mean that when I speak it, it is going to nourish others. That's right. So I have to... You have to absorb it and then be sensitive to how they can absorb it. Now, again, a, a, a Kanishta, I don't expect them to do that. A, a, a Kanishta approach to people. A, a Madhyama approach, yes, I do expect it. It's rich stuff. This is very important stuff to consider, Chaitanya Charanji. Really deep, Prabhu. Yeah. An example of, I was just thinking of uh, one, one, one point I'll conclude now. That yeah. when we say about Prabhupada, uh, needing to understand Prabhupada's words or not parroting them, See, at one level, Prabhupada said, I'm like a postman. I'm, I have not added anything. I have not removed anything. I have simply given what my spiritual master gave me. At the same, another time, Prabhupada in Nectar of Devotion, lecture in Vrindavan, he says, while commenting on Yena Kena Prakaya and Manakrishna Niveshet, that was somehow the fixed mind of Krishna, Prabhupada says, I have practically invented this Krishna consciousness movement. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So what did what Prabhupada was referring to was the essential teachings. They have not changed. And Prabhupada invented the supportive ways by which and the, can... and the peripheral ways. Exactly. Okay. And when Prabhupada gave the peripheral, at that time they might have been supportive, but now they might also become peripheral. So it's that's not right. Individual, it can also be cultural, it can also be time-wise, chronological. They so should call a patra. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, true. Yeah. So to be faithful. So even this statement itself, that I have invented, I have invented the movement, and I have, uh, I have not changed anything. So yeah. 
this state, these two statements itself, if we have to reconcile, we need hermeneutics. That's right. We can't. So, so, yeah. So, in one sense, if we also study Prabhupada's books carefully, uh, we will uh, we will be forced to come up with some hermeneutical hermeneutical frame for understanding them. That's but sometimes right. for us, if we have not consciously thought about it or been guided by it, then our hermeneutical frame might be misguided. That's right. And that's how we may end up with, as you said, vomiting. It's not that right. the person who vomits is ill-intentioned or ill-motivated, is not a bad person. But yeah. by their hermeneutical framework, they might think, hey, this is, this is so sensational. Yeah, sometimes exactly. I see this, you know, sometimes in order to catch attention in a class, Sometimes devotees may speak the most uh, provocative sound bites from Prabhupada's words. And they may get attention, but they actually cause alienation. That's right. That's right. That's true. And that's the nature of an aparad. It moves people away from loving worship. It discourages people. We're not here to discourage people. Anything that discourages people is really something that needs to be looked at. Oh my God. So what you are saying is, so some people might say that the very act of interpreting or categorizing Prabhupada's works is aparad. But what you are saying is, not doing it can, can also be an aparad. Yes. You take Prabhupada's words and repeat them without, understa without understanding whether they are relevant, whether needed for an audience. And, I, I, and many people have done that. You know, If we take some of Prabhupada's statements about African Americans or about other categories, and we repeat them. Actually, yes. see, there's a subtle, there's a subtle level of adwaitan or impersonalist philosophy here. So I said to a devotee, a very advanced Vaishnavi, I consider her a sister of mine. She's very prominent in the movement. I said, all of Prabhupada's words can't be seen as, as merely equal. She said, I consider them all equal. They're said by Prabhupada, they're all equal. I said, so you're taking the phrase Krishna Bhakti Prema to be equal to that of a worm in stool. Now, what I can say is that on one level, because it came from Prabhupada, it's all transcendental. You can't just leave it there. See, that's Abeda. That's Abeda. Beda comes along and says, but they're all, they're distinguishable statements within that Abeda. Everything that Krishna utters in the Bhagavad Gita is transcendental. But there's some things in the, in the Gita there's some things that Krishna puts forward so passionately that they are more important. Bhakti is more important than jnana. Jnana is more important than karma. And yet they're all absolute at the same time. Don't neglect the beda to promote a beda. And don't promote a beta in the to the neglect of beta. Both have to be taken together at the same time. So yes, Krishna, you know, a uh, uh, worm and stool and Krishna bhakti prema. They're 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 both are saturated with Krishna bhakti and Prabhupada's teachings. But the fact is, a worm and stool might be good supportive teaching or a peripheral way of expressing some level of, you know, de degradation or humility or whatever, depending on how it's used, right? But the fact is, dwelling on Krishna Prema, I'd much rather dwell on that than a worm and stool, honestly. So this is such a, both a provocative as well as a satisfying conclusion you have brought it. <laughs> the example is provocative. Worm and stool. <laughs> I, I've warned you that it's very dangerous to have a discussion with me. <laughs> no, but okay. yeah, it's dangerous. It's dangerously, uh, dangerously <laughs> enriching. <laughs> no, but this Abheda and Veda is beautiful. 
So we respect all of Prabhupada's words because they have come from him, because they have come from his heart, which is filled with the intention of glorifying Krishna. That's and it. That saturation of Krishna Bhakti. So we, we consider all of them sacred. So in yes. terms of source, we can consider them sacred. But at the same time, in terms of the content, in terms of the effect, we have to make a bhed. Have to. Otherwise, we are now approaching, we have an Advaitin approach to philosophy and to Prabhupada's words. And that is simply blind. By Advaitin approach, you're saying that all is one. That is what you're saying. So we consider That's all it. Prabhupada's words to be one. God. That's it. So in one sense, if somebody has a oversimplistic notion of loyalty or faithfulness, yes, but actually in the name of being faithful, they might be gravitating towards Advaitism. Right. And that's Kanishta. Every my 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 father, my mother can do no wrong. The more mature attitude we yes. My father, they might have done some wrong, but still, they are my parents. They did so much for me. I am forever grateful to them. There you so go. I want to carry forward their legacy. That's right. Oh. So there's there's a sense of appreciating your parents in an absolute way. There's a sense in which you can appreciate your parents in a relative way, their strengths, their weaknesses, or uh, to, or uh, you know, to get away from that 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 analog. Um, uh, you know, a Radhana Swami's uh, teaching. And uh, Garuda's teaching are exactly the same because they're both teaching about Krishna Bhakti. Well, they're not the same. Mm -hmm. You know, he's also preaching to a much wider audience. I'm a little more uh, selective, uh, a little bit more, uh, and, and I'm, I'm trained in different areas. You know, he's, he's um, uh, extremely talented and uh, we happen to be friends, but that doesn't mean we're the same. Guru is one, Prabhupada says. Hmm. You know why he says it's one? Because it looks so different most of the time. <laughs> That's why. That's why he has to say it is one. <laughs> You're right. The assertion of oneness necessitates the acknowledgement of difference and distinction. The Bhakti Sutra says it's one on the basis of one thing. The grace of divinity comes through the Guru. How it comes through, that is different, distinctive. That it comes through is one. Beautiful. So, for example, some devotees, are their whole life is building temples. And thousands and thousands of people come to the temples. So the grace of Krishna and Prabhupada is coming through their building temples. So yes. say, say now somebody like you is writing books. Somebody else is building communities. Somebody else maybe right. Padyatras and Atyatras and festivals, traveling festivals. So yes. they, they are all gurus in the sense of the grace of guru, grace of Krishna is coming through the guru. Coming but, through. It's transparent via medium. Right. But the way it comes, so we could ah. the way it comes and even the whom it reaches, it may also reach different people. Exactly. Exactly. So that oneness and oneness and difference was present in Shila Prabhupada also and that yes. oneness and difference will manifest in a more we could say overt way in his followers because Prabhupada was so expansive yes Prabhupada was so expansive so some aspect of Prabhupada may inspire a particular follower of Shila Prabhupada and they may That's manifest right. that more and somebody else may manifest that more so they are all different in the sense yes. that they are serving in a different way speaking in a different way leading in a different way, but they are one in yes. the they are all faithful to Prabhupada and serving Shila Prabhupada. Yes, but the fallacy, Chaitanya Charanji, that too often happens is they assume the oneness in Prabhupada's teachings, that everything that he said was the same, without acknowledging the distinctiveness and the understanding of the essential teachings, supportive teachings, peripheral teachings, and within which the peripheral teachings, one finds perspective island, perspectivisms, I call them. And, and you know, the, anyway, you, you have to look at both. You have to embrace both. Otherwise, by embracing only one, you're risking treating Prabhupada in a mundane way. 
Amazing. So most people will say that by embracing Ved, we are treating him in a mundane way. But actually, by not by embracing only uh, uh, a Ved, also we are treating him in a mundane way. That's so right. Embrace both, and that's our philosophy. Achinta Veda Ved is the essence of our philosophy. That's right. That. Exactly. This is wonderful, bro. It's a very, very you could say shastrically sound, as well as intellectually satisfying. Yeah. Not to conclude the discussion. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> Can I try to summarize? I don't know how yes, much time today. It's please. A lot of discussion. So we discussed broadly on the topic of uh, understanding our relationship with Prabhupada's works, and then we discussed how when we read Prabhupada's words, some things just stand out and. Resonate with us. Some things just we kind of difficult to accept. So then you talked about two ways of classifying. One was in terms of the content that there are there are essential, supportive, and peripheral. And another is in terms of people who are reading it. The kanishta, madhyama, and uttama. So these categories are not reified as on the manual. Can't you said who talked about categorization? Right. Uh, right. So now these categories are flexible. And uh, first, we fluid. Look. So yeah, so fluid. Fluid. Right. fluid. Yeah, fluid is better than flexible. Yeah, definitely here. Yeah, things move up and down. So that's right. So, with respect to Kanishta Madhya and Uttama, if somebody simply repeats Prabhupada's words, that is mm -hmm. Kanishta level. A Madhya level is more that they understand, they read Prabhupada's words, understand the teachings, and then. Express them in their own words, but uttama is they draw from the entire body of scriptural wisdom, and they understand what the person needs, and then yeah. do that to them. So uttama yeah. is not just attuned to Krishna, but also attuned to the person. So anyakara and paramanyakara, which you mentioned later. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just as uh, uh, so the just as a person in the mode of ignorance can act in goodness sometimes. So similarly, even a kanishtha can act at a madhyama uttama le uttama level with guidance. Yes. And for us to uh, to act at the uttama level, then we have to look at Prabhupada's teachings. And yes. for Prabhupada's teachings, so the, the essential, say one simple way to understand what is not essential, say Prabhupada's statement about Hitler, Jiva Goswami never talked yes. about. Them. That is not a essential for the practice of bhakti. So they are peripheral. So supportive. You give the example of Varanashram as being supportive. Uh, but if sometimes yes. it is made into essential, then it can become a problem. And then, right. so one of the, uh, that one of the points you made was that how the uttama is has to be very. It's like you talked about with respect to even this uh, madhyama, sorry, uh, this essential, supportive, and peripheral. You also talked there about Prabhupada's speaking style, the Prabhupada's teaching style. So Prabhupada was sometimes used to provoke. Or shock like a Zen master, yes. then he would think on his feet, and he discussed that very volatile topic. That there is his brilliance comes out in his uh, thinking on his feet, but just because things are improvised, there are times when there could be things which uh, may be off from a factual or a logical perspective, and to treat everything as sacrosanct, as uh, inviolably correct. Now we may say that we are being faithful to Prabhupada by that we are we are protecting our loyalty to Prabhupada, but to to be more obsessed or to be more concerned about our loyalty to Prabhupada than to making Prabhupada accessible to others, that is actually a form of ahankar. That's right. So, so we want to, uh, if we are concerned about others, we may say that I accept everything that Prabhupada says, but we have to be aware of how Prabhu others are going to see it. And yes. then we have to make it accessible for them. So that's yes. the idea of translating Prabhupada's works. So yes. translating means that make it intelligible. So it could be that 1920s language and 2020s language itself is different. And yes. understanding that Prabhupada himself acknowledged that his command over English was not perfect. So fixing English seems to be we accept that now. Extent to what extent editing has been done. That is okay. That is a diff different issue. But then we talk about reason and logic. Sometimes Prabhupada's arguments, we may say that's cutting too close uh, to our mm -hmm. to the nerve of our faith. But Prabhupada uses arguments to make particular points. And if those yes. arguments don't stand in a, with a particular audience, then we are not uh, rejecting Prabhupada, but we are 
focusing on the purpose that prabhupad has and ensuring that purpose is fulfilled so even logic is like a specialized field and just as right. prabhupad had disciples who were who were who were more specialized in in than him than in math or in uh, in science, in chemistry or whatever so somebody might be more specialized in logic and they can they may find something objectionable in prabhupad's words and to ensure that that objection doesn't stop them from moving toward toward to, toward the heart of prabhupad's teachings we need to present things in a appropriate way yeah, so yeah. just like if prabhupad interested in the temple we would ensure the maintenance of the temple by maybe changing forms of accessibility not door here we won't remove the dt similarly for us we have to make the legacy of prabhupad's works also accessible and you give the example of how in a academic audience some of the argument that prabhupad used would never work but by although you didn't directly distribute books uh, physically to people but book teach book education leads to book distribution in a way that actually leads to book study and book appreciation also so so we talked about mistakes that the acharya's mistakes are categorically different from our mistakes a child might lose a key because of being playful or irresponsible an adult might misplace a car key because they are thinking of so many bigger things so for prabhupad is completely filled with thoughts of krishna and for him facts of this world or perspectives about this world or logical arguments they are they are secondary they are they are just to be used to get people to come closer to krishna yes, so yes. even if there is a mistake in that that mistake is not a flaw and we shouldn't equate it with our mistakes but if we we claim that there is no mistake at all then people who see the mistake will will find it very difficult to progress forward and come to prabhupad's core teachings yes so then you talk we talk also about the principle of father parent and child of father and son that the father is actually pleased when the son becomes one's own person and carries on and carries on the legacy of the father so That's a right. child imitating the father is nice a small child imitating but the adult continuing to imitate is not is the adult has to learn and speak on his own so right. this applies to us also in our spiritual life at a kanishtha level we may imitate but at a madha madhyama and uttama level we need to assimilate and then share in a way that is accessible attractive and applicable for people so you give the provocative example at one level we may say parroting is simply harmless but parroting can also be harmful if it yes. becomes like we take in nourishing food but then we vomit it out so certain instructions may nourish us certain statements of prabhupada's words but if speaking them to others doesn't it alienates them then that we we can't do that instead we eat the food we become nourished and then we find out what will nourish the other person and serve them that food so that requires us also to become aware or sensitive about others so you talked about hermeneutics is a big big uh, uh, is a big part of our tradition itself the mimamsa is there and then the essence of hermeneutics you mentioned in the, late, the later part is that we take in the whole body or we take in the scripture so we center on the audience so the other individual and then we we pro provide things in a way that they can internalize and be nourished and their sphere of awareness expands so if we are able to do that then actually we are serving shri prabhupad otherwise we may be in the name of loyalty being be, be doing a disservice so we may do an aparad to prabhupad so you talked about also having a bhashyapedia that we need to this is a the this is the next frontier in devotional writing the elephant in the room that we are not addressing that we need to have commentaries on prabhupad's works so that these works can be accessible so if prabhupad's works are like shruti then then what we write will be a smriti by which people can understand and appreciate prabhupada's essential and glorious message of bhakti and yes. toward the end this was very a lot of other points but i don't want this to go on and on but the point about bhed and aved i think that was very important that because prabhupada has spoken that spoken his words with the pure intention of glorifying krishna so in that sense everything prabhupada speaks is transcendental that's abhed aspect but in terms of the content of what he has spoken and 
what effect it is going to have on people there is bhed over there and uh, if we don't ap- appreciate both aspects bhed and abhed if we embrace only the abhed aspect then we may be going toward mayavad where we all everything is one or we may even end up treating uh, having a mundane approach so we may alienate people so the bhed and abhed means we respect the sanctity of prabhupada's words but also we we respect the sanctity of prabhupada's mission and prabhupada's mission is not just that we repeat his words but that we get people to come closer to krishna mm. and yeah. for that purpose uh, it is our responsibility as uh, as faithful so faithfulness uh, we need to in one sense nuance our or broaden our understanding of faithfulness this prabhupada was creative prabhupada was resourceful prabhupad was uh, provocative so yeah. like prabhupad saying that notion of lsd means of i could like notion of lsd so statements like this both demonstrate prabhupad's resourcefulness in presenting in a way that is accessible but they also require us to contextualize prabhupad statement so being faithful to prabhupad also means being faithful to the to the resourcefulness of prabhupad to the flexibility of prabhupad and ensuring that we are also resourceful in carrying forward prabhupad's legacy yeah so I'd like to add in the last words prabhu you did a beautiful job and i couldn't have summarized it as well as you did ah it's a wonderful thing to have such a stream of nectar coming and i wish i can keep many of these points forever in my heart and i'm making a list of things which <laughs> i said that you know things i wish i knew 15 years ago in krishna consciousness so i same here <laughs> so better late than never <laughs> yes indeed indeed yes sir thank you very much for your enriching and uh, and inspiring association through thank you for yours chaitanya jhanji right yeah bro